What happens when you get the call? You've been activated, your number's up. You've been assigned to a mission that's known to be difficult, some would say impossible. Without an infusion of resources and significant manpower, you'll fail. You don't pick the time or place, but after prayer and reflection, you know it's not an option to say no. Our guests today had their lives turned upside down because of those unexpected deployments, but they were ready. What we can learn from a West Point grad and Iraqi war vet who this January will take the oath to become a new member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives? Well, how did his wife and family become critical team members? And later on in the show, we'll go on deployment with someone whose assignment made him miss voting in person and Thanksgiving dinner this year. I hope you stay with us. Rob and Kelsey Mercury are Pittsburghers. A few months ago, they were running their small packing and shipping store in Wexford, and Rob was making a great living as a banking executive. When their state representative, Mike Terzai, announced his retirement, he asked Rob to run for a seat. Terzai wasn't an ordinary rank-and-file member. He was the conservative House Speaker, a newsmaker that would overnight shine a spotlight on Rob. The race wouldn't be ordinary either. With Democrats and Republicans making it a top target in the most contentious presidential year in decades, well, but Rob and Kelsey saw it as a mission, a way to love their neighbors. What they didn't know was the way both sides would view their candidacy for their own purpose, sometimes putting them and their children in the crossfire. How did their family survive the attacks? What did they learn? How did they love their opponent? What can we learn about trusting God when the outcome of a mission is behind the wall? When the Speaker of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives surprised observers by announcing a return to the private sector before the end of his term, the question of his successor became front page news. Speaker Terzai endorsed an Iraqi war veteran and West Point graduate, Rob Mercury. The race became a flashpoint in the suburban battle for the White House, with groups on both sides spending big to win the suburban Pittsburgh seat. But how would Rob Mercury and his wife Kelsey navigate a divisive and negative campaign? How would they explain attack commercials labeling him a hater and bigot to their children? And how would he love and serve neighbors while managing the fallout of a contentious election? How would he accept the assignment but remain true to his first calling as a husband and dad? Rob and Kelsey, thank you so much for joining me today. It's so great to have you on State of Independence, and uh, welcome to the show. Uh, tell me and tell our viewers, how did, how did you guys meet? You, obviously, you're a, a lovely couple, but, but tell, tell everybody how you met. Hey, Joe, and, and uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us. It's quite an honor to be here with you, and I uh, love the intro, and, and uh, you know we're just glad to be on the other side of the contentious race, but really now, the work begins, and uh, and our story goes back uh, over two decades. Uh, we met each other uh, in church youth group uh, as young people who uh, were really just getting started. And uh, what we found in each other was a common faith and a common desire uh, to make a difference in the world. That's really and sweet. I, I was somebody. Thank you. I was somebody who uh, wanted to pursue a military career. I was already headed to West Point. And uh, so Kelsey knew what she was getting into, I think, <laughs> at least we both thought we knew. Uh, but there were twists and turns along the way. 9-11 happened my sophomore year at West Point. And, uh, and Kelsey and I have had the privilege of walking together through hills and valleys. And um, it's been just really uh, enriching for our relationship um, to serve alongside each other. We actually did, did, did you think in 2020 that you were going to be uh, involved in a contentious campaign uh, running for the state house of reps in, in, in Pennsylvania? No, I don't think we ever saw that coming. <laughs> but, uh, but that was the opportunity that we did feel called to pursue. Um, and in some ways, I think uh, we were prepared for it. Um, and so I don't think we saw it coming in the way that it unfolded, how, Joe. But how, how did it happen? I mean, did, did, uh, did uh, Representative Car uh, Terzai uh, give you a call? I mean, how did you find out about, about the fact that he was going to be stepping aside? Yeah, so Kelsey and I were, were sitting 
in our uh, basement living room and, and got a call uh, just after the new year from Speaker Terzai. And actually, we had been uh, pursuing kind of a, a, a life choice uh, to re-enter public service after wearing the uniform uh, for 10 years um, and then being in the private sector. You mentioned my banking career. Um, Kelsey works for our church. And so I was pursuing, you know, uh, kind of God's call in my life of um, how do we navigate this current phase? And, you know, I wanted to be a part of the solution in lowering the rancor in, in the public sector, I mean, in our political discourse. And so we knew that that was something that I may have an opportunity to step into, uh, but we never would have thought that uh, in this uh, important political year, Speaker Terzai would have called um, and asked us uh, to consider a run and that he was stepping down. Um, and so the way that that unfolded, uh, we felt was really providential. Yeah, well, well, were you surprised? I mean, uh, uh, good and bad about what it takes to campaign. I mean, uh, having to raise all that money and, 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 and the negative stuff that comes at you. I mean, tell me what, what surprised you, good and bad. Yeah, lot, lots of surprises along the way, as I mentioned, hills and valleys, twists and turns. Uh, but I think, you know, ultimately uh, that military career and, and Kelsey as a military family, we felt really well equipped to kind of weather the storm. Yes. And, you know, when you have bullets flying at you in, in Iraq um, and you're overseas on a deployment away from family, uh, which, which we did, uh, these kind of attacks in the political sector, in our community, uh, now they were hard, but I think we, we had a framework to kind of process them. And, uh, and so I think, you know, part of the surprise was um, good and, and part of the surprise was bad. I think the, the negative rancor, how personal the attacks uh, be, uh, began to be, how it feels to be on the other side of those attacks uh, were, were new to us. Uh, but at the same time, I think we were surprised and encouraged by uh, the courage that uh, we each had and the stamina for the race. And in some ways we felt like we were, you know, created for this moment. Did, did, did anybody, I mean, did it get to the point where like, uh, uh, where you or Kelsey uh, were shopping somewhere, you were at a mall and, and somebody came up to you and said something nasty or, I mean, uh, I mean, tell, tell me. Well, there were a few moments uh, where, where people would surprise us uh, by the fact that they would believe some of the attacks. Mm -hmm. And I think that was maybe how, how I was most surprised. And Kelsey, I don't know if you have anything that occurred like that, but um, there was one instance where someone, uh, we were out knocking doors and, and someone, uh, you know, raised their voice at us and, and mentioned one of the attacks as uh, truth, truthful and factual, uh, when in fact, and, and she didn't give us time in that instance to, you know, explain, you know, our point of view. But uh, I think a lot of people do see the ads and, and believe them. Um, and so I think that's something that we all as a collective society have to um, realize that a lot so, of this so, uh, negative advertising is believable. So, so what about for, for, for you, Kelsey, as the wife of the candidate? You know, right. I mean, you, you know him. I mean, you know, you're, you're his spouse and you love him. And, and then you, you hear these things. And then people also assign some of this untrue negative stuff to you as well. I mean, how is it for you dealing with that? Well, that's a great question. I think the work we had done leading up to the start of this year was really uh, instrumental in our ability to receive information and process it. One of the things we did with our kids early on in the year, pre-COVID even, was to review a criticism quadrant. We actually, uh, fresh off the press, pulled it right off our wall. And it just talked about, you know, like how we're going to receive criticism. Are we receiving criticism from someone who knows us and is for us? Well, maybe what they're speaking is true and we should take that into consideration and, and tweak it. But if someone was coming to us and they weren't for us and they didn't know us at all, which in the case of criticism for Rob was very much the case, uh, we didn't have to allow that to stick. We could process it. It could sting a little bit. But we were able to discard that because that person really was in a contest uh, against Rob, who, you know, they didn't know, know that person. They don't know Rob. They weren't for Rob. They didn't want to see him be favorable. And so the things that they said weren't going to hurt us as much. And that really gave us a great framework to work from. We had it in our kitchen along with everything else that we wrote down and stuck up there. And uh, that was a good reminder for us. Uh, and it's it's relational. So it's transferable to the, the campaign setting, to classrooms, to neighborhood relationships. And I feel like that was a, a great tool for our family. 
Yes. Well, of course, you know, there's always a challenge for Christian people. You know, it's one thing you know, for, for folks to be candidates for office. Uh, it's another thing for them to be uh, Christians first and then also to be candidates for office. Uh, that's a challenge, you know, to love your neighbor. How do you love your neighbor like you love yourself? And, and especially in this 2020 election cycle, this is supposed to be the most contentious cycle that we'd seen in clearly in decades for many people in their lifetime. And, and tell me what it was like on the ground, that is, because, you know, you were actually, everybody else was watching, but you all were right in the thick of it. It was you, it was your family. Uh, right. uh, you experienced it. Was it is the, do you sense the, the, the division that so many people feel? I mean, you're in a, you're in a what's called, a, I think, a safe uh, a Pittsburgh suburb. Um, do, do you feel the division there? Is, it a, is America as divided as, as it seems? To you? You know, I think the I think the issues that are at play in this election are real. I think they were tangible for us uh, because you know I was running for office and, and we were we we've become a political family. Um, and in our neighborhoods, we saw that come to life. So we would see signs in people's yards for candidates that we didn't know were very political. Um, and you know, there were lots of signs, and we would see right. um, you know lots of money being spent on advertisements and billboards. So you could touch and feel the political nature and the division uh, between the two parties, I think, in a way that uh, we hadn't previously in our 10 years in this neighborhood. Um, but I think that said, uh, we were refreshed by the goodness of people around us. And we were encouraged by a community of people, mm -hmm. uh, friends and neighbors who poured into us. And, and we don't know if they voted for us necessarily, but they saw us going through a difficult time and they... Uh, treated us to a meal, or you know, they asked about how it was going, and so we felt very, very uh, well provided for and loved by our community. And so I think we come through this difficult time, and I think it would have been true win or lose. We're fortunate to have won, but I think we we've come through this uh, experience um, appreciating the value of community in a way that maybe we didn't before, um, and also appreciating how important it is for all of us to be true stakeholders in our government and in our democracy. And I think we've described it as kind of a thin line between those who are governed and those who are governing. Right. And Joe, you know this as somebody who's been up close and personal in presidential politics and national politics, uh, we're experiencing it at a, at a local level. But I think we will always, uh, from this point forward, be um, stakeholders and, and we will be involved locally you know, school board races, the PTO, the fabric of the community, um, and also now state government, um, and certainly involved um, as we as we can be to make sure that uh, we're contributing to our democracy. And, and that's the beautiful thing about this country. And we really felt it. Even in this contentious year, we've worked through this process, and it's been mostly peaceful in our community. It certainly was mostly respectful, even though there were a lot of uh, words said back and forth, but I think uh, we feel encouraged about um, our community and our government uh, going through the process. Well, that's the big challenge. The big challenge in all of this is, uh, you know, you, you run for office, uh, people say uh, bad things, uh, mean things, hurtful things, and then if you happen to be elected, uh, as you are, uh, then you serve all the people. You, you serve, they're all your neighbors, uh, and whether they were for you or against you. Uh, what were some of the things that that, I mean, Republicans wanted you to win, Democrats didn't want you to win, now you're elected to serve everybody. What were some of the things that people were, were, were saying, and, and how did it, did any of those things impact your family, or, or in, in your mind, impact your capacity to be able to serve everybody once, once the election was over? Yeah, there, there are a couple moments that stand out that, that we can talk to. I think one of the things that the other side attempted to do, and, and they were, you know, it was the other campaign, but it was also outside interest groups. They were attempting to connect our local race to national issues that felt out of touch with what was really going on on the ground. Our attempt was to keep it local and keep it very personal. So we did a lot of door knocking. We did a lot of phone calls. We, we to the extent we could, looked people in the eye and met them mm -hmm. and let them meet us and get to know our family. We call ourselves Team Mercury. Uh, because we have a team mindset to it. Yeah. And, uh, and we learned that from the military, um, that uh, you know, great teams um, get great things done. And yeah. we need each other. It's not individual people, but it's collective teams. Um, I think 
you know, some of the attacks when they were personal, um, especially on social media, we really discovered that social media can be a very divisive um, and yeah. difficult platform. And uh, I think people in groups sometimes team up on other people and they say things that they wouldn't say if you were one on one with right. them. Right. Uh -huh. right. And uh, and so one of the tough moments was, you know, our kids were very involved in the campaign. They were cheering us on and uh, and they started to notice because they're just starting into social media. They noticed some of these unkind attacks and name calls. And those were tough moments, I think. But they were also opportunities for us to sit down and say, well, we know this isn't true, just like Kelsey talked about the criticism quadrant. And we don't know this person. And so we're, we're going to let it kind of roll off our back. We're not going to mm -hmm. focus on it. And I think that gives them, as kids, good handles for their own social interactions sure. yeah. that they'll encounter where there's unkind people saying untrue things. That, that, that's what, what you all have done and how you handled your campaign is really a model uh, for, for statesmanship and how Christian people ought to, ought to act in the midst of a heated battle. Uh, you guys are a great team, and we, we, we love you. We're praying for you. And, uh, and we're praying for people who are for you and against you as well. But uh, God bless you in your, in your work now as the new uh, representative elect for your district. And uh, we're looking to hear some great things from you. God bless you both. Thank you, Joe. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you so Thanks much. for having us. You're welcome. We'll be right back. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. What an inspiration to hear Rob and Kelsey talk about how they navigated the political minefield, but their family is stronger for it. I hope you found them as encouraging as I did. Well, now I have the honor of welcoming a combat veteran and Pennsylvania resident, Mike Glass. Mike is still serving his country and today joins us from a location far away from the studio. We can only say that his mission of protecting Americans and our allies continues. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much, Joe. It's good to be here. Yeah, so glad to have you. Uh, you, you, are, you are a true patriot. Uh, you know, we talk about patriots all the time, about people who, who put themselves in harm's way for the rest of us. Uh, you have done that. Uh, your, your life is really the model of that, and you're doing it even as we speak. So we're just grateful to God for you and for your service to the to, to country. Um, you know, some people understand the warrior culture uh, because it's part of their DNA, but, but there seem to be fewer and, and, and maybe few people who think uh, probably the way you do, that this is a way of life uh, uh, that can, they can choose for themselves and, and that the risks are worth it. Um, uh, tell us about you. Uh, tell us um, what's happened to the concept of duty the concept of, of serving country. Uh, t tell us what the idea of enlisting and, and serving uh, means and, and how it fits into our culture today. Yeah, uh, it almost has an anachronism to it uh, sometimes in our very independent culture. Uh, but really, that duty goes into a play of discipline and that daily uh, sharpening of the saw, as we sometimes talk about in the communities I run in. So, uh, I think as Christians, even more so, it's apparent that we have a calling. Uh, we have a duty that requires that discipline. I'm a big fan of the book Roaring Lambs, where it talks about the idea that just because you're not in the ministry doesn't mean you don't have a ministry. <laughs> yeah. Similarly, uh, I'd say warrior culture, you bring that up. Uh, you don't have to be in warfare to have a warrior mindset, truly. Uh, I really appreciate what Team Mercury was talking about earlier with the idea of getting into that that culture and tapping into the service and making that difference in the world, uh, that's really where the warrior culture comes in, putting a risk out there in the most risk averse culture that we could have and uh, taking that risk when we're a dopamine driven culture that knows nothing but uh, the pleasure and the entertainment of the phones in our pocket or the social media we constantly view. Uh, it's truly a challenge to break away from that cycle of uh, pleasure on pleasure, or entertainment on entertainment. And we see ourselves as uh, truly someone willing to take risks, willing to uh, put our ourselves out there and willing to overcome the barriers of things like the commissioning that uh, Rob and I went through and uh, really or seeing my young enlisted guys go through that barrier to entry and finding their way into being one of that small segment of the population. Only about 1.3 million Americans currently serve in the armed forces. When you look at that, that's less than a third of a percent that's currently active in the armed forces. When you count the veterans that are currently living, that's still almost 
just barely a percent of our population. One percent wow. of our population wow. has that connectivity. And so it's a proud moment. But uh, we're really unfamiliar as a culture sometimes with service before self. So uh, that's where it comes in for me and my team coming out here and being a part of something bigger than ourselves, but also demonstrating to the world that we represent uh, a concept uh, that truly exceeds any political ideology. It's it's a it's truly a belief system that's founded in um, a, a promise on a piece of paper, a principle, a flag, not a political party. So, so here it is. You're an American who puts himself every day in harm's way for all of us. And, 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 and not just harm, you're willing to risk your life for it. What does it feel like as an American who does that, who has who's given his life to protect our institutions, our way of government? How does it feel to have watched the, the, the 2020 election in the United States and to have watched it from afar. And, and then did you feel like you wanted to be out here, like you wanted to be part of the rallies, you wanted to be, you wanted to be in the mix, that you wanted to be on one side or the other, you know, cheering folks on? How did it feel from, from where you sit? While it might feel detached, like I was talking about earlier, that 1.3 million Americans that serve in the military, only about 15% really get to experience a combat deployment. And folks like Rob and I have gotten to do it over and over again, and that's a real challenge, but we get used to that. We get used to that detachment. We see the uh, opportunity to demonstrate and put feet on what we believe as Americans. Uh, having that confidence to show that resolute support for a process that models to other people what it looks like to be an American who believes in a process so much that we're willing to remove ourselves from the process and participate remotely and not feeling like we need to sit there in our house and guard it against uh, an election falling apart. Uh, it is different as a member of the military that uh, we're quiet professionals. We don't cheer. We don't rally. We don't do that in uniforms. That's something distinct about our country. We don't believe in warrior kings. Uh, we are not aloof. We are not aloof as, a, as the warrior class, but we're engaged. We have our druthers, but we don't necessarily voice them. We have our confidence in the democratic process that represents us. Uh, once again, our oath of office was to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Not a person, but a principle on a piece of paper. And that's something that I'm proud of. And we have a unique view being outside the process, maybe even a, a blessed uh, respite from being in that combat of the, uh, of the political process right now. Uh, being outside of that has been really joyful sometimes in watching our coalition partners and the host nation watch the process with us. So, so how do we look? I mean, you know, here in the United States, <laughs> we, we, we see ourselves and we think we're pretty cool, you know, here in the United States. You know, we, we're the greatest country in, in, the, in the world. That's what we believe. I, I know I do. But, but how do we look? How do we look to, to people in other parts of the world? I mean, do we, do we look like that? How, what do they see that's, that's fascinating or important about us? Do they, they just see us for our celebrities, for, for the sports or, or for the movies? How do they categorize us? How do they see us? Honestly, they see us idealistically. Uh, they see the best in us sometimes. Uh, oftentimes in the chow hall, they'll have the BBC running in the background or the Bundeswehr TV for the Germans or even some of the local media networks. And they have a really keen interest on they don't see that inroads of fighting between uh, conservative and liberal. They don't see that. Uh, they don't see that as distinct. They see it as some impressive ideologies. They're used to seeing five political parties in Germany that have a big voice, 11 political parliamentary parties, uh, parties in the UK. There are over, over 80 political parties in my host nation right now. So to see two, it's almost <laughs> laughable for them and they, they really enjoy watching it. But um, they're used to severe violence in this country when there's political unrest. So they honestly see our process as admirable. Uh, they step away from the uh, goofiness of some of what we have and they really see us as a city on a hill in some regards. Uh, some of them are honestly more informed about the electoral college than some of my neighbors. So they're fascinated by the process that here's the voice of, you know, what we'd consider flyover country sometimes. They're very engaged. They're very interested to see what happens next. In a country that's 65 percent illiterate here where I'm at, they're actively listening and watching what we're doing with really uh, uh, highly attentive eyes. Mm. So they know our movies, they know our sports, they know our politics and, and what, what's going on. Uh, that, that, that's just amazing. That, that's how they see us. Let, let, let me ask you another question that, that maybe uh, even is even more, more, hits more closely to home. And, and that is, how do you stay calm? You know, how do you stay calm in, 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 in the midst of being in an environment where at any moment you could lose your life? 
How do you, how do you stay calm and centered uh, in, in, the, in the midst of that kind of a storm? Well, I mean, at the beginning of the segment, you spoke about the duty call uh, that we have and the discipline that comes with that. Um, we spoke about that. And I think that we can take comfort in the Bible when uh, Luke 7 talks about being a man under authority. Uh, I am doubly so. I, I not only have my command element here and I not only give command, but uh, I'm under authority of an even higher command. I know the guy who made the mountains out there. I know the guy who runs the storm. I know that. um, And I believe that. So I can have a laser focus and be more attentive to those little things. And uh, instead of being that ugly American out here who, you know, talks about carpet bombing, letting God sort them out or having that football attitude of a linebacker, we can be more surgical. We can be less sledgehammery. Um, And in those moments of chaos, we can pick our battles wisely. And I loved hearing, uh, you know, what Robin Kelsey talked about. The idea of watching that, you know, watching the way we react to criticism, watching the way we react to attacks and watching ourselves when we go on the offensive. Those are tremendously important decisions. Uh, I constantly adhere to Matthew 10 and my team hears me say it all the time. We have to be as shrewd as serpents and uh, gentle as doves. Uh, We're called to do that. Matthew 10, 16. Sometimes the guys don't know what I'm referencing when I say it, but they know I believe it. Um, And and we're called to do that. So in those moments, I, I genuinely hold to the truth that. I know the master of the storm. I know who made the mountains. Um, I I don't fear that. I know what my eternity looks like. And I know that being apart from my family right now is worth a more eternal glory. And I'm getting a chance to make that difference. And I believe that Uh, what we're doing here does matter. What we're doing here does echo back to the attacks of September 11, 2001. And it demonstrates our commitment to the world that uh, we will be an exceptional nation. As you talk about one of the Uh, least bad options out there. We are the best of all the possible bads. Uh, We're a fallen image, but we're doing it uh, for the right reason. So uh, I personally believe that what was true in the light when I, when I had that, you know, goodness or comfort of home uh, doesn't change. God does not become any less sovereign just because I'm under attack. Yeah. Well, Mike, uh, I just love your attitude and, uh, and in the, the closing moments, just, just say hi to your, your wife and your daughter. Well, foremost, thanks for this fantastic opportunity. Uh, As a husband who just celebrated my 10th anniversary with my wife and as a father to a little girl who's turning eight soon, I'm very proud to be here. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining me in State of Independence. Our program is designed to encourage you, to give you hope, to remind you to stay in the path by trusting God with your whole heart and mind and soul and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Special thanks to Representative-elect Rob Mercury and his wife Kelsey for sharing their journey with us. And to Mike Glass, we pray for God's protection for you and your family while you are fulfilling your mission overseas. And as always, connect with me at joewatkins.net. I see every email. I'd love to hear from you. God bless you. Thanks so much for watching. You were excellent, Mike. Thanks. You Thank were you. awesome. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. You guys, you guys are a tough act to follow. Joe Watkins State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV. Positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.